On the agenda tonight, we're going back to 1969. We're going to be taking a look at Laura Nero, and she's going to be performing Save the Country. <laughs> Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. So it's going to be a short one for tonight because I think this is only a couple of minutes just over in length. So we'll get Laura up on screen and see how she gets on. And there we have it. As always, the link to this video is gonna be in the description below. As you can see, it is a longer performance video because she also performs He's a Runner before Save the Country. But as an influence in the music industry, Laura Nero had such an impact on so many singer-songwriters and she wasn't really in the public eye for a long time and it was, due to the nature of her being shy, I think, and not really wanting to get involved with the celebrity and fame side of music, but what a songwriter and what a songwriter for other artists as well. We've pretty much got everything in this performance from a compositional standpoint, but also from a vocal standpoint because Laura's range, she goes from a D5 to a D4, just in the verse here, and the vocal cord connection that she gets when she releases into her head voice, it is so clean and so accurate pitch-wise as well. We have the total change in tempo as well. As she's unaccompanied here, there's no drum kit. It means that Laura can just go with the flow with the composition and how she wants to increase speed, decrease speed. And with the original record, you'll find that at the end, it stays up tempo and we get a lot more production coming in. We do get, I think to begin with a tambourine, but then a lot more rhythmic elements that come in and then the whole orchestra get involved. So it is really dramatic on that original record. But here, 
Laura just controls that tempo the whole way through, gives you that light and shade of the composition, as well as the message of the composition as well. With this composition and the performance and the way that Laura wrote, you really do get the impression that she threw caution to the wind and just went in whichever direction she felt herself getting pulled in. And with this performance, it's a great example of that with the change in tempo. Also the chord progression, which we will probably get the guitar out just to show you guys, but it's not gonna be an instructional video, but just to show you the changes that go on just in the verse, it is something that has been referred to by Elton John. He was hugely influenced by Laura, her songwriting, and the fact that her melodic changes and her rhythmic changes within her compositions was something that Elton had never heard before. In fact, he said that he idolized Laura Nero. It's a great indication of how seemingly wild the songs would be, but obviously they are so well controlled from a vocal standpoint and from that progression standpoint. But when you're hearing it for the first time, it does pull you all over the place because it is such an unpredictable journey that you have to hear it again. It is something that a lot of musicians and songwriters, when they're listening to other artists, especially mainstream pop artists, that might use the same progression all the time. They know where those songs are going before you even get there because you've heard it all before. Whereas artists like Laura not only threw together progressions you weren't expecting, chord wise, also melody lines you're not expecting, but she changes that tempo. So it means that the journey is always changing. You're speeding up, you're slowing down. So it means that you just go on that journey with Laura. And the great thing is the more you listen to it, the more interesting it becomes because you can start to understand it on a musical level. And Obviously, with great songwriters as well, there's a message within the lyrical content, and we certainly have that here. It also gives you a clear indication of the amount of fans she had within the industry, and still does, listening back to her music, the level of songwriting ability, vocal ability, instrumental ability, and multi-instrumentalist, by the way, Laura was, but having people like Janice Ian, Todd Rundgren as well, massively influenced by Laura, Paul Stanley, Alice Cooper, it's the range of artists that have been influenced by Laura because it's not just singer-songwriters, not just folk artists, but all across the board have taken something from Laura's ability and that approach to songwriting. It is something that Todd said himself that once he heard Laura's songs, he stopped writing like The Who and songs that sounded like The Who material and started to try and write songs like Laura Nero. So we're not gonna be going through all of the chords, but just to give you guys a snapshot example of what Elton John's referring to when he says the audacity of the rhythmic and melodic changes that you get in Laura's compositions, I'm gonna play through all of the chords and then we'll analyze it afterwards. I'm just gonna take the verse. We're not gonna be going through the whole song here. And straight off the bat, we have this bouncy rhythm going on. So that's what you want going on with that right hand. Obviously, I'm playing this on guitar and not piano, but the chords are the same on piano. There are different voicings going on that Laura's playing, but fundamentally, it is this. So we're starting on D. Just like that, and then Laura will start up with the second verse. So, breaking that down, there is so much going on with those chord changes because normally you might get two, three, or four chords that are then going to just go around in a circle and the melodies placed over the top of that. Whereas, with this bouncy rhythm we've got, we've got an instant change from D to G. So we've got this like that. B minor, run down, A to G, G back to D, G to C. Where did that come from? And when we're on the C, we go back to the D again, to an F sharp minor. Again, where's that coming from? 
And from the F sharp minor, we go to a rundown on your A string here. We're going from C, B, A, G into an A. And then we have a dramatic pause going back into that second verse. So breaking that down, there's so much going on. And it is these changes that happen that do take you by surprise. Like I said, when you're used to particular progressions, you're expecting to go in a particular direction. Whereas Laura never did that. It would always throw in a chord that you're not expecting. So this is just a snapshot example of it. So the way it's been pieced together, it is just throwing caution to the wind or it sounds like that. But then when you start to hear it again and again and the way that the melody works over the top as well, and then the message of the song, you start to get a bit of an appreciation why Laura is in the Songwriters Hall of Fame. That was in 2010 and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as well. That's 2012. Just to touch on her voice again, because I've mentioned the D5 that she hits in the verse. The top note that she hits vocally here is an F sharp five. So it's way up there with her vocal tone and control. It sounds like she could almost go as high as she wanted to. And she did have a mezzo soprano range and it spanned three octaves. So she's got that luxury of taking her vocal wherever she wants to, which is another important part about the songwriting she just had that ability to throw so many chords together that you're not expecting, but she's got the voice to allow her to throw together so many notes you're not expecting because anybody trying to cover this would have such a difficult job because of the range that's covered, like in the verse, an octave straight off the bat. I do want to get into the history just briefly and Laura's career. She said herself that she had a difficult childhood and music was her way of coping with that. She taught herself piano. She also read poetry and listened to her mum's records. And that included Nina Simone, Judy Garland, Billie Holiday, as well as classical music. So a wide range of influences that went into her music in the future. She also went out singing on street corners, singing in different harmony groups, because that's what happened at that time. Her father was a jazz trumpeter and piano tuner, and through his work, he had contact with Artie Mogul and Paul Barry, and they auditioned Laura with a mind to managing her, and that went well, so they started to manage Laura and did negotiate a recording contract. Just for reference, this is happening in 1966, and they got into the studio, recorded an album, and that album would be released in 1967 and that was the more than a new discovery album which interestingly had songs on there that would then in the future be covered by other artists and become hits for them such as blood sweat and tears and barbara streisand also in 1966 laura would have been 18 years of age and she sold one of her songs and when i die to peter paul and mary and she sold that for five thousand dollars and in 1967, she performed at the Monterey Pop Festival. And this is when David Geffen got involved because he wanted to become Laura's agent. And he realized that the recording contract that she had and the management contract that she had was signed when she was a minor. So it wasn't legally binding and they took both the management and the record company to court in order to allow David to then sign Laura himself and become her agent. So they set up a publishing company and that was called Tuna Fish Music. And it was agreed between Laura and David that they would split everything 50-50. With the contract that Laura had signed with Columbia, she was actually given a lot of creative freedom. And in 1968, she released the album Eli and the 13th Confession. And that was critically acclaimed, went down really well. In 1969, she released New York Tenderberry. And from that album, Time and Love was very popular, as well as Save the Country, the song that we've just listened to. In 1969 is when Laura and David sold Tuna Fish Music, the publishing company that they had set up previously, and they sold this for $4.5 million, and that was to CBS. And this is the thing that you rarely see in the music industry ever, is a 50-50 split between the artist who is 
recording, writing, and releasing the music with the publishing company. And then the publishing company, David Geffen in this case, also taking 50%, but just splitting it down the middle. So it turned out that by the age of 21, Laura was now a millionaire. So with all that said, the need to go out and tour and try and make as much money as possible wasn't really there. That generally comes with the record label who are pushing a particular artist to get out there as much as possible, to do as many gigs as possible so that they can take the gate receipts and start to break even with the loan that they've lent that artist to record and cover all of their expenses so that they can break even and then start to make a profit. And that's why the artists are worked so hard. The artists don't get to see any of that money that is made as a profit, they only pay back the money that they were given as the loan. So it's an interesting thing to look at that if you do have a lot of artists who are very well known and they are famous and they're touring a lot, they are touring to make money for the record label. The pressure comes from the record label to get out there, to tour, to play as much as possible so that they can make as much money as possible. But Laura was in the rare position of being a millionaire, so therefore money wasn't really an issue. She didn't have to go out and tour. In 1970, she released Christmas and the Beads of Sweat, and Dwayne Allman, by the way, played on that album. In 1971, she released Gonna Take a Miracle, and it was at that point that David Geffen then set up Asylum Records, and this was partly due to the fact that Jackson Brown was looking for a record label and David wanted to get involved with Jackson and Jackson and Laura were in a relationship at that time. You can check out Jackson independently on the channel here somewhere if you want to, because there is a video on Jackson Brown. But the problem was that David set up Asylum Records and announced that Laura was going to be the first artist signed to that record label, but Laura didn't warn David that she had just signed or was going to sign another contract with Columbia Records. So it meant that David's idea of signing Laura didn't come to fruition, and he did see that as a bit of a double cross and being stabbed in the back. But as you can tell from this performance, Laura seemed to be naturally shy and didn't appear on TV a lot. She wasn't interested in the fame and celebrity side of the music industry. So she did retire at the age of 24, but did return again in 1976 to release her album Smile. And she toured for four months after that, which resulted in the 1977 live album Season of Lights. In 1978, she released her album Nested, and that was while she was expecting. She took another break after that, understandably, and in 1984, released Mother's Spiritual. And in 1988, she then toured, and that resulted in the live album 1989, which was called Laura Live at the Bottom Line. In 1993, she released Walk the Dog and Light the Light, and throughout the 90s, she played live and was offered places on TV shows to come and perform, but she really wasn't interested in the fame side of things, so she didn't appear on TV. Unfortunately and sadly, in 1997, Laura passed away due to ovarian cancer at the age of 49, and her mother actually passed away from ovarian cancer at the age of 49 as well, and that was back in 1975. So a sad end to the story, but Laura is a classic example of a true artist and such a talented songwriter, performer, singer, but somebody who wanted to stay out of the limelight. And it's an important thing to mention about people in the limelight and artists in general, that I think a lot of people think that having fame means that you have talent, whereas that isn't always the case. Laura's a great example of someone who wasn't world known in the mainstream industry, but was somebody that the people who were in the industry, the real top artists, knew of and respected because they knew exactly how talented she was. But thank you guys so much for suggesting this video for me to take a look at and keep those suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think. And if you did enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and I'll see you guys at the next one. Rock.